subtle skills, big results. Welcome to the Ninja Selling Podcast. Welcome back to the Ninja Selling Podcast. Matt and Garrett are with you again with a special guest today. I'm very excited to have Shelly Culbertson with us, and we're going to explain to you who Shelly is and why she's here. As we get started in the podcast, as always, if you want to check out more about where all these systems come from and more about where you can learn more about Ninja Selling, please go to ninjaselling.com. You can learn all about upcoming classes, coaching, events, all the good stuff that we offer. And uh, if you want to learn more about the people that listen to this podcast and build more of a community for yourself, go on to Facebook, to our Facebook group, which is just the Ninja Selling community, or it's actually the Ninja Selling podcast is what it is. And once you're there, you can post questions, you can learn more about the systems, you can also talk about the episodes and uh, share thoughts and opinions. All positive. Please keep it positive. I have a very sensitive side that if you decide to criticize me, <laughs> it could go the bad way. So uh, keep it positive. And uh, Matt, good morning. Good morning. Good morning to you, Garrett. And good morning to Shelly. I'm really excited Shelly's here because Shelly runs an incredible business. And there's so many different things that we can talk about today. We are going to zero in on kind of a particular part of her business, which is something that a lot of people struggle with. And and Shelly has cracked the code for herself in this, which might give some people some other ideas. So Shelly, good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. I'm excited to be here. Got my coffee in hand. And Shelly woke up early for us too, because it is it is early over there on the West Coast. Um, so thanks for making it an early time too. So to give it a little bit of background for Shelly here, Shelly's been in real estate now for how many years, Shelly? Uh, 10 years. So we got 10 years in real estate. Shelly's also a coach. Dude, high five. High five. Way to go, Shelly. Also, she's a coach for us. Shelly's an amazing coach. Uh, she runs the real estate business with her husband, Dave, and uh, they crush it in Medford, Oregon. So as you're listening to this, if you're like, ooh, somebody in Medford, Oregon that I can refer to, relate to, Shelly is a, an amazing real estate agent as well as coach. So just keep that in mind for the Swiss Army knife of Shelly Culbertson that we're about to talk to. Thank you very much for that, Garrett. Yeah. So excited uh, to have you on today because specifically we have a topic and there's a reason that we had you on. It's not just because you're the Swiss Army knife. The reason that we actually are talking today is you were sharing with me a while back. We actually were having a conversation about hiring assistants. And this is a conversation that comes up in coaching all the time. People reach out to us going, what is the proper way to hire an assistant? Usually somebody's looking for the actual like hiring process. Like, how do I go through? And they just magically all of a sudden have an assistant and everything's supposed to be okay. And you started telling me about like your whole picture surrounding bringing on an assistant, bringing on somebody to help you with your business. And then you said something to me that was so great. You said, this is not a long-term working relationship. I bring them on, I take them to a certain level, and then I kick them out of the nest. And I was like, well, that is the opposite of every person that I've ever worked with, with how do you hire an assistant? And if your business was failing, I'd be like, all right, you might want to change some things, Shelly, but your business isn't failing. You guys are crushing it. You do approximately 60 transactions a year. You take six to eight weeks of vacation. I know this because I find you often in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> and your clients love you. So you have a system that works. So Shelly, I know I just it did a, a lot here, but I wanted to kind of give everybody a little bit of a background about who you are, why we should be listening to you. And let's dive into this because you have a really unique process. Thank you, Garrett. And I appreciate being on. I feel strongly that one of my missions is to make it a better industry one agent at a time. And part of that is taking what I've learned over the 10 years. And really, I've been with Ninja nine years. So I've been brought up in real estate through Ninja. So taking what I've learned that has helped me be successful, not only in business, but in my life with Ninja, that I need to be passing that on and paying it forward to other people. So with that said, as our business began to grow, we realized that we were lacking with um, life outside of real estate. It was like we were both in real estate. Our whole world was real estate. And that's sustainable for a period, but for a long period of time, it's just not healthy. It's where burnout comes in. So it's a number one thing. Yeah, you had talked about an assistant. So we actually, it's kind of two different dynamics that we could talk about, but I want to talk more so about bringing on buyer's agents. 
So the way our team is laid out, we have a transaction coordinator that's virtual. We have a, an assistant assistant that's an hourly employee that does all of our marketing for us. For example, I take a listing, they run with it, get all the marketing out. They manage our social media. They manage our, our flow that we have our four touches a month. She works about 25 hours a week and has been with me for, I think she's on her eighth year. So that's a different dynamic. The dynamic that I was talking about with what we kind of call short-term person, um, short-term to me is anywhere from a year to my longest one has been two and a half years. And that's bringing on buyer's agents. And that's, that's an agent that when our business is thriving, well, it's always thriving, but when it, when we have more business that we cannot handle when it comes to buyers, that's when the buyer's agent walks alongside us and picks up the slack. Shelly, I appreciate you kind of clarifying assistance here. When I look at assistance, I think of anybody there to assist you with the business. Mm -hmm. And so I, my brain kind of goes down that route as anybody that I bring in. So specifically, like this is your buyer's process for hiring on buyer's agents for to help out you and Dave. Yes. Love it. And now that comes to Shelly, you mentioned like that comes after the transaction coordinator and the assistant assistant, marketing assistant, you know, because those people are longer term folks, if you can hold on to them, right? And then now, it, now we move into like, all right, great. Now the business is humming. This is where you're getting to that point where you're like, we need time off because you're still doing everything. And isn't that every agent's dream? Like how yes. many people do we have come to us like, I got to this business so I could do whatever I want. And all I'm doing is real estate. Fooled you. Yes. <laughs> like this is some awful joke. Even in my dreams. <laughs> what keyed you into being, and you and Dave saying, hey, we need to hire our first one. When did the first one come around? That's such a great question. Our threshold started when we were hitting about four to five, about four transactions a month. Because the year that we brought the assistant on was a year coming off when we closed 46 transactions. And that's when we realized, you know, we did the analyze, analyzed how much time we took off and we realized we hadn't taken any time off. Mm. And we were starting to hit that burnout. So at that point, we said, well, how do we want to handle this? And that's when we bought, we, we looked within our office for ninjas. And we brought on our first buyer's agent with somebody that only been in the business for about six months. Now, when you made that first decision to bring somebody in, how was the working relationship when you brought this, the first one in? Because I know you learned a lot as going through this. You've learned a ton over the years of what works and what doesn't. And that's what we're going to talk about today. How did the first one work? Was that a perfect fit right out of the bag? Did that work and kind of hit all the, the, the things you were looking for? Or was that a... No, that's the one that only lasted less than a year. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't the fault of either ourself or the agent. What the bigger piece was is, you know, you learn as you go as you do things. And as we all know, when we got into real estate, what we love about Ninja is there's processes. Mm -hmm. What happened, what I realized, what I learned, we learned coming out of that was one, I needed to have my own processes, systems, checklists. I needed to have all that in place before I brought another team member on because it's utter chaos if you try to create that stuff while you're trying to also show somebody how you do your business. I think it's a, it's a trap that a lot of people fall into is they know they're told by everybody they have to hire help, they have to bring somebody to help them with their business. And they find that person, they bring them in and the person's like, well, what do you want me doing? And they're like, well, just shadow me for a while and I'll, I'll give you stuff or I'll try. And then a lot of realtors, or any business owners will sometimes say, I feel like I, I have a new job, which is finding this person things to do. And when you said that to me the other day, as we were kind of preparing for this, that was one of the things that really stood out to me was you said, if you don't have your processes in place up front and have something you can hand to somebody, you opening up mass confusion. And I 100% agree with that. And, and what I mean by process is it's something as simple as having the 10-step buyer process, 100 copies in a file, 100 copies of the 12-step, 100 copies of the pre-listing checklist. That way, when somebody comes to the table, everybody knows you pull the checklist out, the 10 step, and you go sit at the table and you complete it in front of the client. The other piece that, that we learned is everybody handles files differently. It's just the way it works. Some people print them, some people keep them online. So 
what a requirement we made after this first person was that if you were going to come on as a buyer's agent, that you've got to transaction coordinate for us for a couple months. And it can be anywhere from two months to about six months. Once everybody feels that you understand how the flow of our team works, because you learn a lot with the transaction coordinating, it helps with, with the systems. And we, we would also pay them. We have a virtual transaction coordinator right now that, you know, we can go, okay, we're turning you off for three months, then we'll bring you back on. They're good about that. So I find that in them learning that from the inside out. The other piece I didn't mention is we also bring on newer agents. Yep. I, we try to bring on agents that have been in the business usually less than four to six months. Well, you don't want any bad habits, Shelly? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have a way you think this should work? Okay, wait. We're... Okay, as you probably already figured out, I'm a little bit of a power personality. <laughs> <laughs> and when somebody comes in and tells me how I need to run my business, that doesn't go well. <laughs> okay, so we got new agents. I'll take note of that. Less than four uh -huh. to six months. They must transaction coordinate for a while. I'm assuming this is all to keep a very co consistent customer journey, customer experience for anybody who's working with you, yes. regardless of who the person is. Now, when you when you went through this first agent and you're looking for the second one and you're like, okay, we got all these processes now, we're doing this. Was the intention initially like we're only going to have this person for a couple of years or was that something that you also learned along the way where we're going to train these people up and then release them back into the, to the real estate wonderland? I love, Matt, that you, you expressed that. It was the second person we, we, we came up with that one. Okay. And the other piece that we learned with the first one and the second one, and it's also kind of, it, it's just a rule of thumb as you, you're a ninja. We look at personality types mm -hmm. and we don't want somebody that is a mirrored personality of ourselves. So for example, if we brought on another strong power person, then my whole struggle would be two power people knocking heads. If you have two perfection people, they probably wouldn't get anything done because it's not perfect. And that's typically how people hire too, right? They're like, ooh, I, we get along. Like we're, we're buds. Like yes. we're going to, yes. it feels yeah. good. feels good to have somebody I can party with. Yeah, well, yeah. Two party people, they probably never show houses. Ooh. They'd be out partying yeah. the whole time. I need a perfection person in my life is, is who I need. Like if I'm going to hire somebody on, I need someone that's going to look over the details mm -hmm. and be like, Garrett, settle for a second. Come over here. Like, yeah. this is what's going on today. <laughs> <laughs> Not that anybody can see that from the outside, but... <laughs> But that, that was another learning piece we got. Now, with our second person, she, after about 18 months, she, she was a party person. She had a bit of power with her, but her party was pretty strong, very dynamic individual. And after about a year, year and a half, we really encouraged people to build their own database. She just started taking off. Wow. it's awesome. And it got to where it was, well... We really need somebody. I need help with showing houses, but she was busy showing her own houses too. And so that's when we thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe this is one where we just train people up in the business. And we know when the time comes for her, it came in about 18 months to where I just looked at her and I said, are you have a sustainable business on your own right now? She goes, yeah, I'm doing really well. I said, well, you know what? I'm going to bring on another buyer's agent and I'm going to let you fly the coop. What's so cool is when you have the clear understanding about what you're doing and you can see it, then it, obviously you, you're learning this as you go. But as you start to document and going like, actually, this is our process is to make these people be to a place that they can go out on their own. You get to now celebrate when that happens, not go, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> we're losing this really good person now it's like oh this is perfect this is what our plan is designed around and now i'm going to bring in somebody else and you can also be open with them too that as we're helping you grow and turn into somebody who's going to be sustainable on their own we're going to be bringing in somebody in because if you don't have that clear communication and you bring somebody in and they're going oh my gosh i'm being replaced no, I, I don't understand why you're having to bring in help. I can do it. Don't worry. I can take care of it. And you're like, no, it's okay. The communication is incredible, Shelly. And I love that you've, you've owned that with these people too. Around this whole idea of this process of bringing people in, you said something as we were getting started, which was you need to be able to also let go of people quickly if it's not working out. Yes. And I want to hit on this as we're kind of getting early into this process of hiring somebody. And I've always said, 
you know, hire slow, fire fast. I think because you know, take your time to really find the right person. But if it's not the right person, you got to get them out of your world. And you resonated with that. Well, you actually brought it up. I resonated with it. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about that. Like, what what do you look for quickly, just so you can make that decision? And I know, yeah, just curious to hear your thoughts. Well, I, I I'll give you an example. An example of what, and, and this is where you've got to have transparency, but not only with the buyer's agent, but with your clients. So I had a, a long-term client. We hit, we brought somebody on that personality wise was a really good fit, but professional, professionally, can't pronounce that word. This it's, a, it's a big word. It's it a really chilly. <laughs> they, they didn't op- operate it at the same level of professionalism that we did, which is fine. You know, and not that we have a high, high level. I like to think we do, but they would use choice words sometimes off the cuff. And I actually, you know, I'm filling in the blanks. <laughs> yes, you can feel free to fill in the blanks. And it's it's interesting because I had actually a client say something to me about it. And I said, well, you know, I, I said, give me some, they, they, the way the client had expressed it, well, they just don't, they don't have the professional level you do. Well, tell me more about that. (laughs) (laughs) And they said, well, and then they started just to share a little bit. I said, okay, that's good. Thank you so much for the feedback. So I just went back and, you know, had a discussion with this person and just expressed that, you know what, I understand that that is how you operate. And I'm finding with a lot of the generation that's, that's okay with some people. So I said, I just don't think you're a good fit. That's important. It was within a couple months. It was, you know, they just starting to show properties. Nothing like finding out your employees are dropping F bombs. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> well, it's important to identify those red flags for two reasons. One, you can either correct it quickly with someone if someone's eager to learn and, and fix something. What you're talking about is more probably like a personality issue versus like they missed something on a transaction that they can learn and, and they won't miss that again. Yes. But either way, these are things that you you want to address early on to make that determination is, is this person going to stay and learn or is this person going to going to move on and build a different type of business? Because when you bring on particularly a buyer's agent, they are representative of your brand, right? They're not, you know, John Smith agent, they're Shelly uh-huh. Culberson team agent, right? Uh-huh. Uh, at that point. Huge. Which, which also leads me to Shelly, like upfront bringing people on. So backing up to how you bring people on, because I know a lot of people are probably saying, well, how do you, how do you do that? How do you encourage people to join your team? And how, how do you incentivize them? Because when you think about a, a real estate team, there's not really much growth. Like that buyer's agent is not going to become Shelly Culberson, right? I mean, at least on that team, but you're giving them this path where you can go become that on your own team, right? So they they kind of see a growth pattern there, but then coming back to incentivizing them to join your team, how does that all work? So I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of it, but I can give you an overview. So when we bring somebody on, we do have the conversation that it's kind of a mentorship. And I encourage them that you're going to have your own business and you do not need to bring that under the umbrella of the team. Your business is your own business. And I want I want, I encourage you to go out there and get it. So you're going to have opportunities to work open houses. I encourage you to go get your own clients. I'm going to give you opportunities with sign calls. I'm going to give you opportunities of people that I do not know and have people that have not been referred to me that will become your own clients. So that's part of the incentives. That's huge though. That is huge. massive because a lot of agents are like, oh, I need a buyer's agent because one, I need some support. And wouldn't it be nice to like trim a little bit off the top of what they're doing? Whereas here you're saying like, that's your business. Like, I don't want any part of that. Yeah. Because if I'm in flow and doing my Ninja 9, I'm going to have my own bit of business coming in. And that's the most important thing as I'm listening to you, Shelly, is like you already have a well-established sphere of influence. You already have a well-established database. That means these outside pieces of business coming in, you're not looking at it as like, oh, that's mine. I get to hold on to that. That's now building my database, building my business even bigger. You're like, I've got a good running solid business that gives me 60 transactions a year, allows me to take six to eight weeks away. I don't want more transactions. This is building other people's businesses, which is such a brilliant mindset around this and letting those deals go. I'm assuming your people stay your people and there's an agreement. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Well, it's, it's it's interesting you say that because I we have somebody that, you know, we closed seven years ago 
and the agent that had left the coop with that was asked to leave the coop had reached out and called that person because they had showed him houses. And when we were, we were in flow with them and making one of our call cycle calls to them, seeing how they were doing, they said, so and so called us and we don't know why. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but again, my clients are not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Well, yeah, that comes down to you having the relationship, right? I mean, there's. And- yeah, I have the. And if, and if I'm staying in front of my people and staying in flow with my people, my people are my people. Exactly. You know, I, that's that's a point that I think a lot of people miss. They worry about people taking their clients. And and we did an episode on this care at one point. If you're losing clients, it's not the other agent's fault who picked them up. It's your own fault for not being in flow and letting them go. Well, you left the back door open. That's what I yeah. would say. <laughs> I like that. That's a great way to look at it. Okay. So you have, so you, you presented as a mentorship. So continue on from there. Okay. And so when we agree to have them, when they, they come on and they transaction coordinate until they can get the business going, we pay them just like we would a transaction coordinator. So they at least have some income coming in. Something we didn't talk about is when I'm looking at that newer agent, it really needs to be somebody that has been to an installation or I can see has that ninja mindset where they want to build a relationship referral business. It's not somebody that is going to be doing you know, that their business model is making 200 cold calls and knocking on a hundred doors a week or whatever that looks like. I want somebody that believes in the ninja process. And if they haven't been, do you have them go? Yes. So here's the deal. If they haven't been before they even talk to me, they have to read the ninja selling book. Perfect. Like my little tabs in there. <laughs> yeah, those look good. For yeah. those of you who do. <laughs> They have to read the ninja selling book. Shelly's book has got all the little tabs and all the little nuggets in there. Of like where to go for where. I see the real estate review on yes. one on yes, there the very, very one. prominently. <laughs> and so the goal is that they get to the next possible installation that they can. At point in time, they can't afford to go. What I will do is go ahead and send them. And then I will make an agreement on how they're going to reimburse us through the transaction coordinating. Nice. That's awesome. I think it's great that you you have them get this understanding of what you're up to with this process. And because again, I mean, you're talking about having them be part of the 10 step buyers process, understand what all these systems are. And as you're helping them grow and build their business, you want somebody that is, that is in a like mindset with you. They understand the language that you're speaking. And uh, the more so you can surround yourself with like-minded people speaking all the same language, it helps everybody grow better. And you also make sure that when you do have them work with one of your clients, that they're getting taken care of it the way that you would be taking care of them yourself, maybe at level. Yes. And, and it's funny that you, with that said, I'm going to build on that a little bit because once they, they've agreed and we're, we're moving forward, they sit in on every single buyer's process. And our buyer's process are very, very systematic. We have, you know, 100 sets of 10-step buyer process in a file cabinet. We have a buyer's process. We pull that out of the file cabinet. We all go sit down with the buyers. And it's a roundtable discussion around the buyer's process. We have fun with it. Mm-hmm. But the purpose of them being in that buyer's process is at the point in time they have to open a door or even write a contract. Or, you know, last year we took two and a half weeks and we went out of the country. So they were writing contracts for us. I want there to be a relationship because my clients, that's why they come to us. They like the relationship. And if all of a sudden I'm out of the country for two and a half weeks and some stranger's writing the most important contract they may ever write in their life, it's not fair. It's not how I want to do business. Mm-hmm. Well, we've all experienced it. And Matt, we've talked about it on, on episodes in the past of that, that moment when you're working with somebody, you know, you like, you trust you, you, you're, that's your comfort level of like, we're going to be safe through this because we have Shelly in our corner. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, you know, here comes John. And it's like, well, who's John? Like, where did you come from? Where does this guy come from? <laughs> well, and I think that's the the whole experience of clients working and and one thing I think it's important for agents to remember if they're thinking of of growing to this type of level that Shelly you're at is, you know, the customer wants to have this experience with your business and your brand, not just you. Mm-hmm. And if you don't bring people in and introduce people and let them see the whole kind of thing that's going on and bring in all the parties, then you are putting that experience at risk when all of a sudden you shift it over here. Now, 
That said, if you're a solo agent and you don't have buyer's agents and you want to go out of the country for two weeks, there there are processes to help introduce your clients to people and colleagues in the in the company, which but these aren't going to be the newbie agents, right? You know, this is yeah. where you're going to probably hand them off to a Shelly yes. <laughs> <laughs> or somebody else who's going to take really good care, which is going to be a whole different experience. So that's that's a whole different thing. But so I love how you bring them into this process. And then so so they're all everybody gets introduced in in the buyer interview, right? And then what's the protocol for like what happens next? Because I'm assuming sometimes you're handling showings, who's handling customer service calls? Like, how does that all work now with like, what are the typical responsibilities? Oh yeah, no customer service calls. Customer service calls stay within our team. I mean, within Dave and I, Okay. unless we're out of the country. Now, if we're going to be out of the country, then I will let all parties know we're going to be gone. And I will have one of the buyer's agents step in because I also, now we're talking buyer's agents. I'm also, I also carry, I mean, we close a handful of listings a, a year too. So my buyer's agents will step in. Now that's a whole different podcast on how I handle listings and listing reports and all that whole different podcast. Um, but something else. Did you just invite yourself on a different episode? I think you did. <laughs> that's awesome. Way to go. The deceptive close. I love it, Shelly. A little subtle, like, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to make it a better industry one agent at a time. I'm convinced of it. <laughs> so Matt, something, so the next step kind of with that is we use, we'll have them shadow us for a couple, after a buyer's process, a couple showings. Very cool. So they can see how we allow a buyer, we allow the house to sell itself rather than, you know, those agents that come in and go, oh, this is a great kitchen. And the, no. And then we, we talk about with the buyer's agent, the dance. Mm-hmm. We talk about the key questions and this, my favorite one is the 85% rule. So when my buyer's agents within, I would say the first week, they know on a scale of one to a hundred, where are you at with this house? Because we set it up in the buyer's process. So the 85% rule is kind of how we talk. Also the questions like, could you see yourself living in this house? So those are kind of the key aspects that we try to show them when we have showings in a house rather than sitting down and just telling them how to do things. This is like the best training that <laughs> an agent could have, right? I mean, I'm thinking, sitting here thinking like, if you're a brand new agent who's stumbled upon this podcast, just move to Oregon and <laughs> see if you can get to work for Shelly because th this type of training doesn't necessarily, I mean, I know there's probably someone out there, hey, we do this at our company, but like mm -hmm. very, very rare. I mean, most of the training takes place in a classroom this is what you do, do this. And then all of a sudden a brand new agent's out there. I mean, that's the way it was for me. And you're in the situation and there's no one there. And you're like, hmm. So I think this is what we learned on page nine of the text. And let's try it out and see what happens. Whereas you're giving them this entire- Let's practice on our clients. What a concept. Right. <laughs> well, which you're allowing them to watch you do it with a client so they can experience it. But at the same time, they can walk themselves through that practice with a client, but you're there. Yes. And, and what my experience has been over the years, we do the same thing with open houses. So when they go to work their first open house, I love doing open houses. So I will work the open house alongside them. And so it's one of those, I, I don't need to go into the whole open house piece, but it's one of those where you stand back and you let the house sell itself and you get in relationship with people. We find that if we spend the time up front and, and we're talking, we're come, we're invested too for about the first 30 days. But if we spend the time up front, then long run, we have an amazing buyer's agent until they build their own business. We really do. Yeah. Yeah. Shelly, so you were talking about you have a handful of listings. Well, I don't want to go down that path, but percentage wise, how much of your and Dave's business is listings to buyers? Just real quick. We're about 60, 40, 60% listings, 40% buyers. So out of the buyers, obviously you have two buyer's agents you're saying currently right now. Uh -huh. So not just one, you have two. And do you, as you say, they shadow you on a couple, once you have established buyer's agents, do you ever kind of enter that buyer world again? Or do you pretty much stay on the listing side and let your buyer's agents pretty much handle all the buyers moving forward? How does that work? I would say, so walking to our team dynamics, I'm the lead with listings. Dave is the lead with buyers. So I would say Dave is about 50-50. 60, 40, a couple dynamics, the way our team works is Dave and I have made a business 
decision that we will not represent a buyer or seller in the same transaction. As a team? Okay. Or as a team, we just won't. Him and I will not. You know, I don't need to go down those dynamics, but we just, it, I really tout to my, my uh, sellers that we, I work 100% for them. And so let's say that I have a listing and yet one of my buyers comes to the table, wants to buy that listing. We're up front in the buyer's process, letting them know that we're going to work 100% for you, but that also works on the same side with the listing. So if they come to the table and they want to go see our listing, we at that point will go, well, you know what? We're going to have Whispers, one of our buyer's agents right now, we're going to have Whispers show the property. And if you decide to write, Whispers taking the lead on it. So that's just one of the ways that we handle business. And we have it happen probably twice a year. So now when you when you have that agent take the lead as well, now is that client kind of become that buyer's agent? I mean, not long-term necessarily, but like for that transaction, it's all theirs? And and that depends. It depends on where the buyer came from. Yeah. And it depends on our relationship level with the buyer. Okay. But I think that's a great opportunity. You think about it, right? You, you know, this is now a buyer's agent has an opportunity to really step up and be an agent versus just kind of doing, you know, oh, Shelly told me to go show this house or Dave told me to sh- go show this house, right? Yeah. And also this client now feels, again, 100% represented. I remember when I was selling, which was getting longer and longer ago and I was licensed. But the interesting part was that I remember talking about representing both parties, you know, representing the listing, representing the buyer coming in. And I remember one of my mentors going like, that's like the best thing ever. Like you get both sides of the transaction. And my number one thing was how can I honestly represent somebody and truly give them my opinions, my my background, my knowledge of like, this is what we should be watching out for. These are the things that we should be really questioning right now without questioning what my other client is doing. And I, I love that you've built this system where you can pass them off to somebody internally and be like, we can't talk about this. Yeah. Like, I, I can't, I'm not, a, you, you are the full lead. You're running with this. I trust you to take care of them because you've built this am- amazing amount of trust with them. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting because the door, my two doors down for me, I listed that house. This was just this last year. And, um, one of my very close friends that's been my friend for about, I mean, ever since I moved here, wanted to buy the house. I want to be your neighbor. I want to buy the house. Well, I got it listed. So I was just real upfront with her. And I said, you know, I, I would love to represent you in this, but I've got a commitment to this listing. And Whisper took it, executed. It went flawlessly. She's staying in my database. I mean, I drink wine with her once a week. <laughs> <laughs> You're like still my client. Yeah. I know I gave it to you, but still my client. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's it was really fun because when we closed on that transaction, all six of us went out to dinner to celebrate. That's so cool. Including the buyer's agent and her husband. It's awesome. You know, but for me, the key when you're entering into all this with the buyer's agent is transparency. Mm-hmm. And and we we have different levels of how we compensate a buyer's agent. I don't want to go into that. We had the discussions with Code of Ethics. I really can't. The other key is when a buyer is ready to write an offer, we sit down with the buyer's agent. We decide who's going to write the offer, who's going to do negotiations, who's going to be the lead on it. Is it going to be Dave and I, or is it going to be that agent? And we decide right at that point when we're writing the offer, what is the compensation level going to be? What's the split going to be between the buyer's agent and Dave and I? So it could vary deal to deal. Yeah, it does. It varies deal to deal. Now, do you have some base, like once they get out of the transaction kind of coordination phase, is there some level of compensation for showings and and all that kind of stuff? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. We have different levels based on, like I said, once it comes to the point of writing the contract, we make a decision transparency wise, 100% transparency. Okay, you're, the expectation with you in this transaction is you're going to take it because they really like you better than me. And this is, this will be what our split is. Or it might be, you know, we're not going anywhere. We're going to take it to the closing. Thank you for doing the showings. This is what our split's going to be when we're done. Gotcha. So the couple of things here that I'm listening, and I, I've i always known this about you, Shelly, but one is you're fair. This isn't about the Dave and Shelly show and you guys being the most successful people in the room. You're totally fair at making sure everybody's getting compensated for the work that they're doing, the relationships they have. And you see that and you acknowledge it up front. 
massively important to the relationships that you've built. The second thing that's really coming out and just listening to everything that we've talked about so far is that you have an amazing communication style with people where it's like, let's put everything on the table. Let's talk about this. Let's Nothing needs to be assumed about how we're going to be working together, what this is going to be. When you are that clear, when you put that level of communication up front and you expect it from all the people that are on your team, there's very little chance for miscommunication. There's very little chance for frustration, which allows you to, again, to have this really solid foundation. And I just keep making notes about it. It's like amazing communication, amazing communication, setting the stage of what that relationship's going to be. So I just want to compliment you on that. Those two things are just incredible. It's why you have what you have and where you're going. I love it. I get so much joy when they're ready to fly the nest and to have an amazing business because, you know, it has been an amazing industry for me to be in. I've actually been in the industry for over 20 years, but in the real estate side of it, it's just, it is amazing that you can create a life and a business that you just really love being in. And this is a part of it. I have one more question for you, which is right now you have two buyer's agents. How many do you like to have and how many as the max you've ever had? That's beautiful, Garrett, because two is the max. When we first started doing this, we thought we wanted to keep people and build this huge, massive team and keep people long term. And then I realized that I was hurting cats (laughs) (laughs) and that I did not get into this industry so I could manage agents. I got into this industry because I saw it as a great way to have the life that I want and also fund the life that I want. So for us, we probably won't ever have more than two. There's usually two in rotation. One is probably going to be flying the coop here shortly. I'm trying to get her to stay until the other one's back from pregnancy leave. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when we see that one's ready to to go fly the coop, that's when we start looking for the next one to come on. I was going to ask, like, you know, what's the typical overlap? Because I would imagine, particularly with the transparency with clients and stuff, you could have a clients that are in the middle of this home search and you have an agent that's ready, I'm assu- they'll probably finish out with that client. Yes. But maybe other people who are kind of getting introduced to your team. So what is the typical overlap? Is it a couple months? Is it four months, five months? You know, I would say probably f- four to six months. Okay. And then the way we handle it too is the buyer's agent, we're transparent with them and we'll go, okay, we have another buyer process coming up Friday at three o'clock. Which one of you want to do it? Unless we know personality wise, the person that's coming to the table is going to be a better fit with one or the other. But we'll usually throw it out there because if we're going to do a buyer's process at at three o'clock and they're ready to go, that means you need to be available the weekend for showings. Right. Yeah. Because that's clearly what happens next, right? No one's gonna be like, great. Hey, we're all set up and we'll do showings, you know, in a couple of weeks. Like, yeah. <laughs> and you know what, with the volatility of interest rates, they may want to show right after the buyer's process. Yeah. <laughs> now with um, one other question that I have uh, in terms of just readiness of your buyer's agents, because in, in the market that we've been in for the past couple of years, and there could be the cream puff that gets listed today, We could get off this podcast. Cream Buff gets listed today. You already have a full day of appointments. Dave has a full day of appointments. And we got to get this buyer seeing. Are your buyer agents ready to go to to take care of that if they need to? You know, it's all about the setup, isn't it? They're part of our uh, weekly agenda. We do it Monday mornings, 9 o'clock. And whether they are in the office or we Zoom them in, they are on the part of the conversation where who's ready to write a contract this week? And we have the conversation. If a house shows up, who's available when? Love it. What? That's like the perfect answer. <laughs> the way it's, I mean, it's like you know Ninja. It's like you coach it or something. I, I, I don't know. If that's... <laughs> I might coach. You know, I might be a coach. I go back to communication again, though. Too. I mean, like this is just about having open communication and. There's very little chance for mess ups when you are talking as much as you are and bringing them into your world. (laughs) It just, it all makes sense. Well, and the piece with the weekly agenda, everybody does their own. So that's a part of being a part of the team is that you've got to plan your week out. So they're not just listening to your weekly agenda. Like they have- No, they each do their own. Love it. Yep. Because they're running their own business, right? I mean, they're- Uh Uh-huh. Exactly. They're running their own business. 
The purpose is to train them up. And so one other question I have with that, with the training the up is, have you had an experience yet? Or, you know, what would you do if this does come up where you have an agent who's like, I, I don't want to go. I want to stay here. I like being your buyer's agent and running my own business. You know what? I haven't, we haven't had that yet. And I think part of it... Typical real estate agents. <laughs> there's, a certain, there's a certain point that like, I, I can't take any more Shelly. I, I just... yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's it. Right there. Dave's the nice one. I'm not the nice one. <laughs> but, um, you know, and Matt, I think what it is, is they start to see when they get their own momentum going. I see it happen because they're not as available to do the showings and to write the contracts. So when they get their own momentum going, it's one of those, it's kind of a natural evolution that they're ready to go. I think it's a testament to your leadership too, Shelly, you and Dave's leadership and helping them get trained up and recognizing those things. And I'm sure there's words of encouragement that come along the way. So I would give you guys a lot of credit for that too. Oh, thanks. Well, that whole thing of having them want to leave there are a lot of team structures out there that the whole purpose of that team is to never give them the security to go out on their own. And it's always to keep them in there. And so that's where the, you know, you can run into somebody that goes, you are my crutch. You are my safety net. I can't leave Shelly and Dave because I don't know how to do this on my own. So when you're training them constantly the whole time, to make a sustainable business on their own. It's a natural thing that just like we talk about kicking them out of the nest. There's a certain point they just want to fly. Yep. <laughs> it's just the way the <laughs> nature works. Well, and, and they're also they're also seeing, I mean, they're seeing that we are doing our two to three real estate reviews a week. They're seeing that I'm nailing those so many personal notes a week. They're hearing us do the customer service calls. They're hearing us do the you know, the reaching out to my database with phone calls, you know, you model that behavior. It's the expectation that you've got to go get in your database and you've got to do it too. Yeah. That's fantastic. Shelly, thank you so much for sharing this. I mean, it sounds so simple the way you present it. And it comes down to Garrett, what you've highlighted here is communication, transparency, Shelly, you said that many times, but I also think just your vision of understanding that you have your business, you know what you want to do, you're good with it. And, and and we're bringing agents in to help them help us, but also help them help themselves so that they can move on because that's where you're getting the best talent out of them as well as a buyer's agent. So I think that's fantastic. Any Any other points that maybe we haven't mentioned that you'd want to share for people to understand? Don't worry about doing it perfect. It's an evolution. I just walked through the last seven years of having buyer's agents and I wasn't perfect out of the gate. I'm still not perfect. Still learn stuff every day. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the biz. Very important to understand about yourself. As you, want, if, as you want to grow, as you want to be better, the only way you can grow is by making mistakes. Mm -hmm. But then you have to learn from those mistakes too. You know, It's one thing to make mistakes, but if you're making them over and over and over again, back up and rethink what you're doing. But if you're open to making mistakes and learning, it's the fastest way to grow. So good job, Shelly. I love you tons. Thank you for coming and being part of this today. Yeah, that was awesome. Thanks, Shelly. Garrett, thank you. You guys have a good one. For everybody listening out there, thanks for joining in. Definitely, if you have any questions, drop them into our Facebook group. You know, just head over to Facebook and search for the Ninja Selling Podcast. And um Shelly just had to run on us, but I was going to say she's in the Facebook group too. So, you know, you can mention her and tag her and, you know, we'll get some answers if you have some questions, but what a, what a great episode there it was. So, and if you want to learn more about Ninja Selling, if you're like, Hey, what's this book? What's this installation that Shelly's sending these buyers agents to head over to ninjaselling.com to learn more about that and to learn more about coaching as well, because we're here from you if you need that support in your world as well. So appreciate you guys, Garrett, appreciate you. And we'll catch you all on the next one. Thank you, sir. This is awesome. Appreciate everybody. Thanks. If you enjoyed today's episode and would like more, visit us at the ninjasellingpodcast.com. There you will also find links for more information about ninja selling and coaching. Have an incredible day.